The island of Ireland contains two countries, Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, and the rest, which is the Republic of Ireland since 1922. We start our adventures in Ireland with the capital and largest city, Dublin. About two million people of the over five million people in Ireland live in greater Dublin area. After a long flight from Seattle, with a plane change in London, we're welcome to our home for two nights, the Marion Hotel. The hotel consists of four Georgian row houses dating from the beginning of the 19th century. Across the street are the government buildings of the Republic of Ireland. This is the office of the Prime Minister. This is Leinster House, the home of the Irish Parliament. It was originally the palace of the Duke of Leinster. Nearby is the National Art Gallery. Walking off our jet lag, we decide to explore Marion Square. Oscar Wilde spent his childhood at number one Marion Square from 1855 to 1876. So it's fitting that the park contains a statue of the author. This park has several memorials. This one is to the members of the Irish Defense Forces who died in the service of their country. The victim's sculpture consists of a dead soldier mourned by his wife and mother. Even in September, there are a lot of flowers in the park. There are a few birds too. It was not long before our jet lag caught up with us and we decided to have an early dinner and call it a day. We had fish and chips at Kennedy's Pub where Oscar Wilde worked as a teenager. The next morning, after breakfast at the Mirian Hotel, we meet our guide, John Neary, for a walking tour of the city. As we head out, John explains that these Georgian townhouses were the result of several real estate ventures that started in the mid-1700s. St. Stephen's Green is the largest of the Georgian garden squares. Development started in 1664 and evolved as the surrounding properties were filled with Georgian townhouses. Next to St. Stephen's Green is the main shopping street of Dublin, Grafton Street, and the Stephen's Green Shopping Center. Our next stop is Trinity College, founded by Queen Elizabeth I in 1592. It's modeled after Oxford and Cambridge. The college chapel was completed in 1798. Bell Tower is one of the iconic landmarks of Trinity College. It was finished in 1853. The Graduates Memorial Building is home to Trinity's oldest student societies, the Philosophical Society, the Historical Society, and the Theological Society. The most famous piece of history at Trinity College is the Book of Kells. It's the finest of the manuscripts produced from the late 6th century through the early 9th century in the monasteries in Ireland, Scotland, and England. The Book of Kells contains the four Gospels of the Bible. It's famous for the intricate detail of its illuminations. John and Sherry look at the Irish linens with decorations based on the Book of Kells. The long room in the old library was built between 1712 and 1732. It contains 200,000 of the library's oldest books. The room is lined with marble busts of great philosophers and writers and men who supported the college. Many contemporary sculptures can be found outside. We walk north toward the River Leffe. It's the kind of neighborhoods that surround any college campus. The Temple Bar Pub has been serving students since 1840. The Haypenny Bridge over the River Leffe bisects Dublin. It was opened in 1816 
The fare was a halfpenny, the same as the ferry that it replaced. The Dublin City Hall was originally the Royal Stock Exchange between 1769 and 1850. Our next stop is Dublin Castle. Until 1922, it was the seat of British government's administration in Ireland. The Record Tower is the only surviving tower of the medieval castle dating to 1228. Construction began on the Bedford Tower in 1750 and was completed in 1761. It's now used as a conference center. Next to the Record Tower is the Chapel Royal, the official church of the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland between 1814 and 1922. Next to the Dublin Castle is the Dublin Garden. It's the site of the original Dublin, or Black Pool, where Vikings harbored their ships and set up a trading base that gave Dublin its name. There are several small gardens surrounding the grassy sward. This one commemorates the Irish police who have been killed in the line of duty. This bubblegum pink sculpture is a modern take on the story of David and Goliath. It's not just the Nike sneakers and the baseball hat that make this piece modern. It was produced by a 3D printer. On one side of the garden is the Chester Beatty, a museum and library housing the collection of Chester Beatty, a mining magnet. Mr. Beatty had eclectic tastes, very refined tastes. He was especially interested in Asian manuscripts. John tells us we need to step up the pace. We have an appointment at 4 o'clock. We only stop for the most interesting cityscapes. John points up and says, that's what our appointment is about. We're touring the Guinness Storehouse, one of the largest tourist attractions in Dublin. Since opening in 2000, it's had over 20 million visitors. It's not your average brewery tour. It's a multimedia trip that takes you through all aspects of the process, from ingredients, water, grain, and hops, to the fermentation process and how the bubbles get there. Then we meet Arthur Guinness, who founded the brewery in 1759. We move through seven floors. There's a display on how the beer was transported and some memorable marketing campaigns. Finally, we reach the seventh floor and the gravity bar. Here's where we get to taste the product. I'm really smiling under that foam mustache. Now we can say we've been to the mother church of beer. It's starting to rain a little, but we opt to walk back to the hotel. We want to squeeze in a little more Dublin in the waning sunlight. We walk past Bram Stoker's house and a lot of interesting doors on Georgian townhouses. Then we're back at the Mirian Hotel. Tomorrow we are leaving to explore the many shades of green in the Irish countryside. <laughs>